Hello, students and lovers of literature. This is an introductory lecture to uh, English literary studies, uh, but I also, you know, I'm kind of framing this for uh, people who are interested in literature just coming into um, the study of it. Um, and so we got to begin with some questions, uh, really basic questions, um, like, like what is literature itself, right? So outside of literary studies, just what is literature? And a lot of us will come to <clears throat> uh, the idea with a lot of different um, uh, conceptions of, of what those are. And so this lecture is about kind of an introduction to the field of literary study. Um, and it's also... Uh, going to ask us to kind of question where our assumptions about what literature is, um, uh, um, where, where our assumptions might come from. Uh, um, and so what I am going to do is, as, as I walk through some English literary theories and stuff, this is not at all meant to be like an entirely exhaustive scope or of the field, um, but just some ways into starting to think about uh, the idea of literature itself and the idea of its history and the idea of like, well, why do we have a study of literature? This is something I always ask um, students of mine in classes and especially English majors, um, which is like, you know, why do people get paid to study something like literature if it's just about, you know, having really good taste or being well read? Um, I think that as a profession, um, I take my profession much, much more seriously <laughs> than that. Um, and I don't want to come across, and I don't think any English professor should come across as a kind of arbiter of taste across the board. Um, so th that, to, that, that kind of is, is something I, I want to really kind of hone in and begin with. So what does it mean to kind of study literature at the professional level? And then what is the subject matter of what we study? What is literature itself? Now that's gonna be a debated kind of ongoing conversation. What is literature? And so this is something that I ask everybody from the outset to just start thinking about what for you right now at this point in time uh, um, constitutes literature. When somebody says literature, what does it mean? Does it mean newspapers? Or does it only mean like books in the, like behind me on the shelves? Um, uh, how um, does it affect you when you walk into a bookstore? Um, or if you remember walking into bookstores, I'm making this um, while we're under um, COVID-19 kind of lockdown. Uh, um, and so uh, are, how is, are there sections in bookstores that are called literature sections? Who determines what is literature and what is not? These are all questions that are really important to us in terms of the professional study of literature. This is very much an introductory lecture, but I want us to kind of have that idea itself. And so there's a bit of a history of, of my field and where I'm coming from in this uh, initial question, where does English literary studies come from? Okay, so uh, let's go on here. It's like, so, you know, you might think like, duh, <laughs> it comes from England. But actually, it doesn't really come from England um, when we look back historically. The first program actually shows up in Scotland, um, which is not England. Uh, and so this is, comes from the University of Edinburgh's site, um, website. Um, they say Edinburgh is proud to host the oldest department of English literature in the world, having first offered courses on rhetoric and bell letters uh, uh, nearly 250 years ago. And so when we think about English literature and the study of it, um, that's like coming almost about a thousand years after we start having re recording, like documented recordings of the, the language of English, which of course would, would have been old English um, uh, um, back in, in our, some of our, our earliest recordings of the language is being distinct from some of its, its Germanic um, ties beforehand and, and Norse and other types of languages that kind of fuse into this language called English. So uh, English is around, it goes through a number of, of changes before um, we get to modern English, which is, I'm going to use that term modern English around the same time as, as Shakespeare. Um, and I'll have some things to say about, about that in, in various, um, uh, future lectures. 
about what what distinguishes the different periods of the English language. But we're well into what we would call modern English. Um, and from the beginning here, just think about modern English from about, you know, late 1500s, 1600s to the present. Um, so modernity is not uh, the latest iPhone app update or something like that for us it's a for a, uh in in literary studies it's a much broader period and so we look at about 250 years ago so what people weren't really studying english as literature before then um, and we don't get like a bunch of new literary studies in england um even in english uh, until the late 1800s and early 1900s for some reasons i'll talk about in a few minutes um, so people are speaking, writing plays, and I mean, Shakespeare wrote all of his stuff before, well before there were literature, English literature departments. Um, uh, and, and so we've got to think about, so literature at that time period, like what was considered literature with a capital L, would have been um, uh, Roman and Greek stuff. And so uh, in the early modern period, this is kind of the time period when Shakespeare is writing. Um, we have this movement in Europe called the Renaissance, right? And the word Renaissance just means rebirth. And it's when the Europeans starts in kind of Italy and moves up north over the next couple hundred years. Uh, uh, they're, they're, they have, they have re, there's a rebirth in knowledge of the classics, right? Of Greeks and the Romans especially. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, interest in study of literature in other languages than English, right? Uh, and it doesn't mean, so people are starting to write in, in English, write, writing poetry and all this sort of stuff, but it's not being studied in schools as such, as an important thing. Um, so uh, then about 250 years ago, you start seeing these programs in Bell Letters um, and uh, then eventually fully formed literary studies programs. And this will become important in, in a uh, hopefully throughout this lecture why this is what why I'm going into this so here's a little picture of Edinburgh Scotland it's kind of a, a it's a very beautiful town uh, and so this is a, a one of the books I'm going to kind of draw on, on a, a book called Masks of Conquest by um, Gowrie Viswanathan uh, who's a, a literary scholar that's associated with a uh, um, a kind of theoretical school called post-colonialism. I'll talk about that maybe a little bit more later on. Uh, um, but in a book called Masks of Conquest, um, the Swanathon kind of looks back into the 19th century especially and starts looking at um, the ways that English programs first start to develop and makes the argument that English studies, like if you're living in England um, or even Scotland at the time, um, you're not really, everybody's kind of speaking and talking the same language, but it's only with colonization as England moves out and tries to establish colonies around the world, like many European governments uh, did at different times um, throughout the past 500 years, that you start getting these, um, the need to study the language and to teach, quote, natives, indigenous peoples, um, the language itself. And uh, one of the reasons that literary study kind of uh, shows up for Viswanathan is because um, if you're trying to just like, if you walk into a territory and you want to like make Christians out of natives, which is what um, many, m much of the colony, um, colonial sort of project was about, a lot of people, I mean, if you just think about somebody showing up on your doorstep and like telling you, you know, that, that you should convert to their religion. And it's not going to go that well, right? Um, in fact, most missionaries who do show up on your doorstep, they're not really doing it so much to convert you. They're doing it for their own kind of benefit. Uh, um, as, as they go out in, in the world, they're, they're challenging their own sorts of faith, right? Um, but if you just if, if somebody just knocked on your door and said, you should change your whole religion, it's not going to work for a lot of people. And that's kind of what the colonizers sort of started figuring out. It's like, uh, it, it takes different forms for sure in the Spanish colonies and the English colonies, but I'm focusing on England here. Um, 
So this is, I'll read this quote from Viswarathan. Um, the amazingly young history of English literature as a subject of study, less than 150 years old, is frequently noted, but less appreciated is the irony that English literature appeared as a subject in the curriculum of colonies long before it was institutionalized in its home country. As early as the 1820s, when the classical curriculum still reigned supreme in England, despite the strenuous efforts of some of those concerned critics to loose its hold, English as the study of culture and not simply the study of language had already found a secure place in the British curriculum. So this is a really interesting thing that Viswanathan's kind of historical study says, is that we start really getting something like English literary studies from the need to enculturate or make indigenous peoples around the world um, adapt to and appreciate English language and culture. And so from a 21st century perspective, we might think this is pretty, that, that's like kind of a nasty way of, of, of establishing something to study, right? Is that it's really about kind of forcing people or um, uh, making people lose their own culture to, to appreciate um, the supremacy of one's culture. And this, this is something that all English literature students needs to sort of actively deal with is that kind of uh, uh, culturally supremacist um, idea. And that's why I think we really need to question our ideas about what literature is, like literature with a capital L. If we just think of it as like the people who have good taste or the sophisticated people or the intelligent people, all of that sort of stuff, there's there's a lot of class baggage, there's a lot of race baggage um, in that idea itself if you have a kind of unexamined idea of what literature is. And so I want you to be questioning that actively in your own thoughts as we move on throughout this course um, and throughout our readings. And Viswanathan is not the only critic to make these kinds of claims, but uh, I'm, I'm just uh, drawing on Viswanathan here. So uh, if I go on here, um, another quote from the book. Uh, um, uh, and, and Viswanathan is talking about India here in particular, but we could also think about Native Americans um, as well. Uh, Viswanathan says, by giving young Indians a taste of their for the arts and literature of England, quote, uh, we might uh, in, in, insensibly wean their affections from Persian the Persian muse, teach them to despise the barbarous splendor of their ancient princes, and totally supplanting the tastes which flourished under the Mughal reign, make them look to this country, England, with that veneration which the youthful student feels for the classical soil of Greece. So this is a quotation in Viswanathan's book from an article and published in a newspaper in 1825, right? And so this is very, this is kind of active proof that the ways that some English people were thinking in the 1820s was that the reason why we need to teach the indigenous peoples to appreciate England is to wean them from the Persian muse, right? Because that's barbarous. And so it's a very uh, culturally elitist type of program uh, that is going on. Uh, and if that is what carries on in through our study of literature, then that kind of cultural um, superiority or elitism is going to continue as well. So we act actively want to be questioning that in the 21st century. Um, uh, so here's a version of uh, um, a, or a map of England, Eng the English Empire in the um, at its widest extent in 1920. Um, so everything red, and of course earlier the 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 um, east coast of what's now the United States was that. But according to this map, it's a little bit later, so that those aren't colonies anymore. Uh, um, so uh, English studies has been inherently tied to British colonialism. And even in America, where I'm, you know, talking from the United States here, um, we inherit this in our English studies programs, and we have to actively sort of wrestle with that history rather than trying to sort of deny it and just say that, like, we've come to a sort of, like, like uh, a situation where that the, the darkness of the history doesn't matter anymore.
Uh, here's another kind of famous map of, of uh, the in English Empire. What is really interesting if you look at the map is, uh, you know, how uh, broadly, quote, inclusive the map presents itself. If you look at, um, there's Native Americans up there. Um, there are Africans. So there are people of all different kind of types of cultures and races that are supposed to make up um, the the so-called uh, British Empire uh, um, during the 19th century. Uh, um, and so that map is a kind of ideal. And yet, at the same time, when we look at um, uh, the past, we, we, we look at what empires, especially European empires, do is they, they go out to the rest of the world, they colonize them, and they treat the subjects of these other places um, as uh, something to be studied, as knowledge to be built upon, right? And so we think about the knowledge that's gained through conquest, right? And anthropology, which is a, sort of an, another kind of discipline, um, did this as well. It's very much part of co colonialism. Um, and so here's this anthropologist uh, uh, um, who is posing for a, a photograph with some African pygmy people, um, uh, early 19th century, um, or sorry, early 20th century, early 1900s. Uh, and, and this kind of image is being, you know, shot in different places and brought back to uh, England and, and by this point in time, the United States to so, sort of say like, oh, well, our, our anthropologists sort of study these other people and they categorize them and they, they, they um, uh, tell, them, tell, tell us, you know, where their histories are and all sorts of stuff like that. So uh, um, at the same time, and this is really unfortunate part of, part of history, um, people, African people, especially uh, people who have different kind of body types, uh, like the folks in these pictures here, were being brought back to Europe and to England and being um, uh, housed in like museums, like like zoos, like living zoos for people as well. So uh, colonialism has some so just just some really nasty um, tactics to gain knowledge from. Uh, so if I go to the next slide here, um, here's a really famous book. It was published in the early 1980s um, in Terry Eagleton's Introduction to Literary Theory. Um, the Swanathon's perspective is, is informed by post-colonial theory. Um, Terry Eagleton, um, it would be, um, especially during this period, is, is known as a Marxist theorist. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but it just let, to let you know, um, to be a Marxist literary theorist is not necessarily to be a communist, um, uh, but it was a way to sort of uh, uh, step out of the liberal economy and look back on on ourselves. Um, so it's there, there are still uh, strands of it that we use in the 21st century as well. Um, but Eagleton's book is a really good introductory book. Uh, sometimes my, my students today find it a little bit wordy. I still think it's a good book. Um, these are some of the um, ways of looking at literature. So these are different kinds of theories or, um, or uh, different approaches. So you might think of it like if we're studying this thing called literature, which we don't know exactly what it is or we'll have different definitions, there are also different angles and approaches within literary studies. So just like you're putting like something under a microscope, like with a slide, um, you might have different uh, sort of filters for your lenses to see different things. And that's how you should think about these kinds of literary theories. And so there are lots of them. This is not an exhaustive list, but here are some. So phenomenology or reception theory, um, uh, formalism, new criticism, structuralism and semiotics, uh, post-structuralism, deconstruction, psychoanalysis, gender and feminist and queer theories, narrative theory, aesthetics and ethics. Um, uh, so these are all sorts of areas or branches within or ways into to literary theories. I'll use some examples um, later in this lecture. I'll use psychoanalysis as one, one um, particular example, which has been an important uh, way of looking at literature, even though psychoanalysis in the field of psychology, um, uh, uh, and particularly Freud and, and uh, his theories, have been, uh, you know, uh, really, really you know, criticized and 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 put rightly so, like a, a question rightly so from from a sort of scientific standpoint. From a literary studies standpoint, 
um, we're not trying to do uh, medical care for people's brains, um, necessarily speaking. Um, and so the history of psychoanalysis actually is really important for literary study. Uh, so I, I, I'll, I'll dig into some of that in a few minutes. Um, so we want to think about theory and the reason why it's important, even at an introductory level, um, even though we won't be able to study a lot of theory in a, in a kind of introduction class, uh, is that, first of all, no one can read everything. <laughs> and no one can read everything in every language either, right? So there's a lot of other languages and literatures. English isn't the only language that literature exists in. Uh, so that's one thing to think about in terms of a definition of literature. It can transcend one particular language. Uh, um, another reason is that everyone brings some sort of cultural background to their reading, right? So those of us studying English um, literature um, through English literary studies have to address the cultural baggage of colonialism, for example, and that's going to affect the ways that we study literature. Um, uh, another sort of reason here is that so that we can talk to other scholars and other um, people who are interested in literature without playing the game of like, have you read this? Oh, well, you haven't read that? Well, I guess you're not like really well read like I am, right? Because I have all of these books behind me and that obviously means that I'm you know, so smart. Uh, uh, um, literary theory gives us a kind of language to talk about things because somebody who's an expert in Chinese literature really doesn't need to have read like a bunch of 19th century English novels, for example. Um, and so uh, there's, there's kind of a technique or a, a lingua franca, for example, um, a, a way of a kind of professional jargon like there is for any professional discourse um, when we study literature. Um, and so theory is what allows us to do that. Uh, because, um, and then the last dot here, because the production of criticism continues to inform the production of literature. So what that means is that if we're thinking about studying literature professionally, um, there's a history to that profession itself. And so we could talk about, I don't know, Shakespeare criticism. There's like, you know, hundreds of years of Shakespeare criticism. And the criticism changes with the concerns of the time, right? So if we think about something like gender theory right now, right? The discussion around gender in 2020 is really different than the discussion of gender in 1990, for example. Uh, although there were certainly transgendered people in the early 1990s, the robust kind of discourse that we have, public discourse around transgender issues, um, terminology like cisgender, for example, was not widely known in the early 1990s. And so um, uh, just like early feminist movements. If you look at feminism in the 1890s, when it's really kind of a women's suffragist or get women trying to get the right to vote, which goes all the way up into, you know, um, or uh, after the end of World War One, right, which was, at least in the United States, that's when the women, women get the first, get their right to vote. Um, so we call that first wave feminism. And then we have second wave and third wave and and all sorts of waves. So um, we can't just think of a kind of static universal of what criticism means. Criticism and the reason why we study literature and the reason why we keep talking about old literature, whether it's Shakespeare or some something written from Jane Austen, for example, from the 1800s. Um, the reason why we keep looking back to it is not because there's just this idea of a transcendent classic in literature and that if you read the classics, you somehow become a better human being than other people. Um, no, it's that those books have allowed us to keep talking about them in ways that give meaning to our lives in the present, right? Uh, so... Uh, we're going to deal um, specifically with post-colonial theory some um, throughout the readings that, that I'm introducing here this semester, um, and then a little bit of structuralism and semiotics. Um, but I'm going to open the course here with uh, some post-structural and psychoanalytic theory. And you don't really need to know right now what post-structuralism means or anything. Um, I'm just going to give us a way in, and, and what I'm going to try and do as this lecture continues is give us a starting place for a definition of literature. 
that I want you to take throughout the readings in this course. And you can challenge it. Don't assume that I'm trying to say that I have all of the answers here. I don't. Um, but I'm trying to give us some sort of kernel to start with, especially for folks who've not really studied literature beyond sort of being assigned language arts classes and readings in high school, things like this. So thinking again, like what is the professional sort of adult level um, of, of thinking about literature and, and why do we have a discussion of literature itself um, uh, uh, in, terms, in terms of something that people get paid for? Um, we don't get paid as much as the people in the sciences, for sure. We don't get paid very much as, as most of us liter literature professors, but um, uh, the, it, it is still considered, you know, like something that's important to study. It's important enough to have academic programs. And I would like, you know, maybe just for job purposes, I would like to keep it that way. Um, I, I also just think that I think that for lots of reasons, it's very important to be studying literature. Um, so here we go. Um, I'm going to draw on a um, uh, sort of uh, a thinker of psychoanalysis named Jacques Lacan. He's a French guy, and he uh, is basically kind of takes over after Sigmund Freud dies. Um, uh, of uh, he t He's in Paris, so he's not in Vienna in Austria where Freud was, but he kind of takes over Freud's school, um, sp especially in France, and he becomes like the leading critic. And this isn't to say that he doesn't have problems. Um, for those of you who have heard of him, um, we could make a lot of critiques of Jacques Lacan, just like we could make critiques of Freud. Um, what's important for me is the history, the historical trajectory of the study itself. Um, and so uh, it's not to say that that there aren't, you know, I could give a different lecture where I might critique um, Jacques Lacan stuff. Um, but Jacques Lacan, uh, who, if, if this is your first time hearing his name, he's very difficult to read. <laughs> um, uh, he was studying children, especially early on in his career. Um, and eventually he, he stops trying to be like a, a medical doctor, like a, a psychologist, and turns just towards kind of like philosophy and, and theory and literary criticism. So that's why he's really kind of important for us in literary studies. He is still read if you did get, go to a doctoral program in psychology, for example. Um, you can still study him in the field. Um, whereas, he, like, I mean, uh, like, like in, again, uh, in terms of science and, and medical science, like Freud is just not not really useful there but because freud based a lot of his articulations of, of theories on literature and myth he is rich um and his thought has has been rich in our study um but which doesn't mean of course that we shouldn't criticize um uh uh when it's necessary to do so so lacan was studying children and he came up with this this idea called the mirror stage um, uh, and I'm going to use that that idea to kind of articulate one possible definition of literature and what's to follow. So looking at kids, and maybe some of you have done this before, um, if you hold up like a baby, like, like when babies come out of the womb, if you've been like around an infant, they're like, you know, their eyes are like really big. Um, uh, they cry a lot, but they like they kind of have like an almost surprised look on their face, um, and and they take in the world and they're just taking in everything for the, they're seeing everything literally for the first time, right? So there's so much information that a little baby's brain is processing that that they're they're like wide awake and then they have to sleep a lot and then they get cranky and cry and they need to be fed and all all sorts of stuff. But later on, you know, and there's not like a fixed date for this. If you um, hold a baby up to a mirror, um, the baby gets really, really excited. It starts smiling and giggling. And uh, Lacan used that kind of moment in a kid's life um, to talk about this thing going on inside our heads. So just like the Oedipal complex in Freud is just a metaphor for something going on in our head, um, where he used the, Oedip he used the Oedipal myth, um, a story of Oedipus the king, which is a Greek myth, to, to articulate something in, in, that he thought was going on in our heads, the mirror is just a metaphor, right? So Lacan would say that uh, we're going through this developing as humans, whether or not we somebody shows us ourselves in a mirror um, as kids. 
Um, but if you hold up the, a baby to the mirror, the baby starts kind of giggling and laughing. And you gotta kind of like put yourself into the baby's head, right? So the way I'm gonna, this is kind of absurd, the way I'm gonna sort of put this um, out. So say, say I'm holding like a little mini me, little mini, mini Roger, um, and uh, um, I'm holding mini Roger, Roger Jr. I don't have a son <laughs> in real life. Roger Jr. up to the mirror. Roger's like, like, giggling and laughing maybe reaching out towards the mirror and the what Lacan thinks is kind of happening really kind of like in terms of light bulbs going off in the baby's head is that the baby recognizes like look at like that thing in the mirror like like why is Roger there when I know Roger or dad or whoever is holding me at the same time and so what they do is they sort of put two and two together is like oh actually that's like not Roger because Roger's holding me and like the way that things are moving I recognize myself in the mirror and so the reason why the baby is sort of laughing and giggling is that they're conceiving of a vision they're seeing themselves from the outside for the first time right and so that metaphor for Lacan is about the way that the idea of a self or an interior notion of oneself um, later on to become identity is kind of starting to emerge and so there's a separation between um, the interior part of me and the image in the mirror and so the language that uh, he uses is I a separation between I which is ego that's the, the Greek word for I is just ego or ego um, and me which is the image of myself in the mirror right so there's a gap between those two selves and psychologists this is kind of graduate school language but like psychologists call that gap desire right so why is the gap called desire the, des um, the gap is called desire because desire means lack Desire is the thing that I don't have. If I want to have a hamburger for dinner, for example, it's because I'm hungry and I don't have it in my stomach right that right now. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm driven towards the hamburger or whatever I want to eat. I'm driven by the thing that I need or that I lack, right? And so desire is a way of structuring ourselves towards a kind of future that we need to have in order to sustain our being, like being able to eat. Humans need to eat. If they, we don't eat, we die. Um, uh, so psychologists call that desire. Um, identity is starting to emerge here um, uh, between the I and the me, right? Um, so think of the term identity or like identical twins or a secret identity like Batman and Bruce Wayne or Superman and Clark Kent. Uh, you always have to have at least two for identity, right? Um, and so there's this kind of subject and an object. Subject, I, object, me, right? Um, even our grammar and our language shows it. So there again, um, I and me, it says underneath my, my floating uh, window here. So this is all going on in our own heads. We've got this kind of interior se um, separation of self from self and me from the image of myself and so what's important for us in terms of Lacan is that um, with the development of the ego let me just kind of move this up here um, with the the development of the ego uh, uh, representation becomes possible and particularly linguistic representation um, so uh, babies don't come out of the womb being able to talk for example right um, and babies' first words are not like, however, <laughs> because usually they're very tangible things like mama, dada, um, uh, um, sensory things like hot. Unfortunately, sometimes kids learn because they touch something hot and they cry. Um, uh, uh oh, when you drop a, a, um, a drop the bottle, something like that. Um, very spatially um, tangible things are where we first start getting um, speaking words. But we know, so we know from like 21st century language studies, we know that talking to babies while they're inside um, the mother's womb, um, that they get a lot of speech patterns and pitch um, while they're in utero. So I don't want to kind of misconstrue how language development happens. There's a lot that goes on for a baby 
um, while it's inside the mother's womb. And so actually reading to uh, your baby if you're pregnant or you know if your partner is pregnant, reading to the baby, talking a lot, the, that those speech patterns are going to go into a little baby's head. Um, and so we don't always think about this, um, but like, so one of the pitch things that we do in English is um, uh, when we ask someone a question, like our pitch goes up at the end, right? So um, do you really mean that, right? Um, pitch goes up and that pitch going up actually signifies the questionness. Um, and so uh, compared to like some Southeast Asian languages, we're not as pitch centric as, as um, as, as something like Vietnamese in English, but we still have that. Um, so uh, uh, all of that is to say that there's a lot of development going on before kids start s expressing words. A lot of structural things, sentence structures, questions, a lot of ways of talking um, are going on uh, pre-verbally. Um, but what language does when uh, when kids start using it or humans start using it <clears throat> is language is always about representation, right? I is just a kind of sound sign that everybody who speaks English uses for the first person, right? We all use the, ver the, the word I to refer to uh, our individual interior selves. Um, so uh, the development of the eye becomes separate from itself um, in what Lacan calls the mirror stage, and that's part of what he's saying makes linguistic representation possible. And in literary study, we're always studying the ways representation works. So that's why Lacan and psychoanalysis is important for us in literary studies and may be outdated and for really important reasons in, in uh, human, human sciences, for example. Okay, so I keep going here. So the eye also becomes separate from the world um, uh, through this linguistic process, according to Lacan. Um, and that becomes important in terms of human development for him because um, it allows uh, kids to uh, um, start crawling and walking. So he, at least according to Lacan's theory, uh, um, the baby starts after they go through the mirror stage there they, they start being able to talk on the one hand and on another hand that's not as important to us they start crawl like sitting up crawling having a sense of their own our own bodies and as sp spatially inside of a world um, and then eventually walking and things like that so that's not as important for us but right now in this lecture um, but that embodied kind of part is important I'm going to switch gears here and I'm going to give you, let you just look at this slide for a second. And there is a narrative. Um, and so we're not a live class, so I got to kind of walk you through this more. But usually when I put this slide um, up to class, to a class, I say, okay, I'm telling a story here. And um, I give people, you know, a, a little, a few minutes to look at it. So you just look at it. Um, and there's a, you know, if I move this a little bit over, there's that, that's kind of important what this guy has. Um, and um, so usually after like about 30 seconds, one of my students will say something like, oh, well, you're studying, you're telling evolution. And it's pretty quick. It can be like as quick as like 10, 15 seconds. Um, and, and I then ask students like, well, okay, can you explain how that, that's happening. Well, then they say, well, well, you got like the apes and then, you know, you've got this like development of technology sort of happening, sort of moving into the future. Um, and this is kind of this, this that, that, that's correct. That's one of the stories. But what I always sort of point out to people is like, well, what if your first language is something like Hebrew, right? In which you would read like, like right to left. Um, uh, um, instead of left to right, when you'd sort of study the start with this dude here, and then you're kind of working back this way and working back this way. So the way that we form language in terms of this left to right thing in English is important. I call it linear alphabetic text, and that shapes our perception, our our perception of story, of narrative, and of desire, right? Because desire is always about the future. If you've ever been reading a boring book and you're like, how many pages do I have left? There's like, what's it going to take to get to the end? All of that sort of stuff is sort of playing in. So if I go back over here to this guy here, um, this is actually a silver-backed mountain gorilla. 
you can kind of see the silver back there but i took this image because he's got this branch here um uh and so uh that just kind of leads me into this second guy here so this is a chimpanzee this is our closest living relative in terms of um uh, our chromosome structures as humans were only a couple of chromosomes away from a uh, chimpanzee buddy here and so uh the chimpanzee uh, um, uh, anthropologists in the 20th century would study chimpanzees and they would notice that like you know chimpanzees mostly eat um leaves and that they're mostly vegetarians um they'll also eat um ants and insects and occasionally but very occasionally in different kinds of groups occasionally they'll eat meat and occasionally even you know in like a kind of fight with with others they'll they'll occasionally um uh eat eat a fallen um uh chimpanzee but that, that's not like common uh um to to the diet um so not very much meat but very much mostly um vegetarian but uh anthropologists studying chimpanzees would no notice that uh you know, a chimpanzee would go walk over, break a branch off of a tree, strip the leaves off of it, take the branch over to an anthill, stick the little stick down into the anthill, pull it up and eat the ants off of the stick. And this was a big discovery because, you know, for class, if we were face to face, I'd wait for you guys. But the reason why it's important is because it shows us that if even the chimpanzee has a sense of futurity. The chimp could eat lots of different things, but that particular day that chimp was like i would really like to eat some ants right now there aren't any ready at hand how do i get me some ants uh i'm going to change my environment you know i'm gonna break a branch strip it down and uh dip it down the hole um to get the thing that i want i'm gonna change my environment using a tool to um get the thing that i want or the thing that i need you know he doesn't necessarily need to have ants, but uh, he wanted them. So need and want is like not necessarily the same thing. So humans do the same thing. We just take it to like a whole other level, right? And so early, if you take cultural anthropology classes, you'll know that you know you study hand axes. The earlier um, archaic forms of Homo sapiens, which were Homo sapiens, but there are lots of other Homos, Homo erectus, Homo habilis. And so the hand axe is one of the early tools that humans, um, or um, the kind of apes that are between us and chimpanzees, develop. Um, uh, primates uh, that we all are. Um, uh, hand axes allowed uh, early apes to break open bones um of of carcasses like so like you know like lions say like lions for example or big game um you you're not gonna like you know like a saber-toothed tiger tiger for example you're not gonna fare well just kind of going up against them but you might come across um just like any kind of scavengers do like birds come, might come across uh, a fault some fallen prey that's got some meat on it maybe like scraps of meat but if you can break open the bone and get the bone marrow out, which is like high, high protein, um, uh, at least some anthropologists and evolutionists believe that that kind of high protein in our human diet is what kind of helps uh, push us on towards the modern Homo sapiens, which we are right now, right? So we share that kind of tool use with Neanderthal and other um, uh, types of, of um, earlier uh, apes as well. Um, and so you think about like the development of, of agriculture, for example, and, and how long it must have taken, what kind of observation it took um, us as a species to be able to say like, oh, well, if I take this little seed and I put it in the ground and I wait several weeks or I water it or something, I can grow this sort of stuff right like like um but humans sort of figure out how to do it they figure out how to do it in various different places around the world um uh kind of simultaneously um uh um writing that also develops in different places around the world simultaneously um uh, without necessarily having contact um with with other groups um and so humans begin this kind of cultivation and agriculture and and they keep making more and more tools and we shape our environment so we use technology in order to adapt to our environments right that this is kind of an evolutionary way of looking at 
what technology does for us. And so why is this important? If I come back to our lecture here, um, the important thing is to remember that language itself is technology. If we're studying literature, we're studying language. And so uh, <clears throat> humans come to define themselves through the ways they use technology to shape their world. Language is a technology. Um, not just this stuff that I'm like computer I'm talking on, right? Or my cell phone or something. Uh, this is kind of a like more information than you need from this slide here. Um, but this, I just wanted to give a sense of, of where Lacan was coming from. So he was studying um, uh, pigeons in captivity, and this cap happens in his mirror stage uh, uh, um, uh, little essay that he writes. Um, and uh, he's looking at biology, right? So like, and even like, like Sigmund Freud and like early psychologists, they're always looking for a kind of biological component to this stuff. So, and, and they, they, and they get so much stuff wrong in terms of gender and all sorts of stuff. So um, uh, that's important, but it's, it's, it's interesting to look at the ways that literature might um, be commenting and inter the study of literature might be interacting with the study of uh, biology or science. And I think that's an important thing to think about in the 21st century, not to have, to have this divide between the sciences and the humanities so much. Um, uh, uh, and, and also maybe there could be equal pay, like a little bit better pay for those of us in the humanities compared to those of us in the sciences. Um, uh, so maybe those of you guys in the sciences could stick up for us in literature sometimes. Uh, so there's a biological basis for the development of our ability to perceive other people's feelings. Um, and it happens in some of the most evolved parts of our brain. Um, Lacan, uh, for example, was only partially aware of this in the 1930s when he's writing. Um, but now we've had like the decade of the brain, the early 21st century. So we know so much more about brains now than Lacan did. But even if we look back at Lacan, one of the things that he cites is um, uh, 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 the use of mirrors with pigeons in terms of gonad maturation. Um, and so the way to think about this is this, like, this is kind of sad, but if you take a pigeon that's never seen a pigeon, another pigeon that's been born in captivity, um, and you put a mirror into its cage after it's kind of grown, the pigeon will go through puberty, basically. Um, that's a kind of simplistic way of putting it. Um, and, and, but it's like, it's, there's something about animals and we're animals too, that we need to see another animal that's like us. It's just like dogs. When you take your dog for a walk, the dog kind of recognizes another type of dog and they do the butt smelling thing and all of that stuff. Uh, um, and, and of course it's chemicals in their butts that make them want to do that. Uh, <clears throat> So recently, brain science makes similar kinds of arguments about humans, um, uh, that we have these kind of emotion centers in our brains that really allow us to use our creativity and our ability to re represent situations. Um, so uh, another person's situation or a problematic situation to develop our sense of compassion for other people. Right. And this might sound a little bit lovey dovey, but it really is takes imagination to have a sense of compassion for other people, to be able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, for example. And this is something that that um, uh, humans develop, and, and maybe and according to some articles that I've looked at, that maybe, maybe um, women, and uh, there, this is a controversial subject, but maybe women, because of the long history of women um, uh, taking care of children and giving birth to children and having, I mean, men's bodies don't produce the milk for children. So that kind of looking at the baby kind of process might make women a little bit more emotionally intelligent or um, uh, than, than, than men. Um, although uh, I've, I've read some articles on this in scientific journals and um, of course it uh, takes cultural, uh, there, there are other kinds of cultural arguments that might be made um, in that just food for thought. So let me keep going here. Um, the eye also, according to Lacan's thought, separates itself, becomes an object in the world, and it's an object that's potentially harmed or loved by others. Lacan says that the baby, quote, understands itself, or understands itself as, quote, the object of the mother's affection. Um, and that should be an end quote there. Um, so quickly the baby learns that it has uh, competition. 
Um, I pulled this picture from a, a great book by Michael Tosik, who's an anthropologist, called What Color is the Sacred? Um, but what's important, actually, this isn't Tosik, this is Bronislaw Malinowski, who's a really important um, anthropologist in the 20th century. One of the reasons why Malinowski is important, and I don't, because I don't want to take him out of context too much here, is Malinowski helped challenge us in terms of biological theories of race. So um, uh, it's important to, to, to give credit where credit is due. Malinowski like challenged a lot of science at the time, biological science that said that like that white people are sort of like somehow more intelligent or something that, than uh, people of color, which was kind of a going theory in the late 19th and 20th century because of colonialism and all sorts of ethno, what we call ethnocentrism and, and flat out racism today. But nevertheless, when we look at this picture, this picture is really interesting, and I'm kind of drawing on Michael Tosig here and, and what he says about this. But if you look at this picture, and I ask my students, like, where is where does power show up in this picture? Right, I'm going to pull my face down here. Um, there's another guy back over here. Um, yeah, um, how does power show up? And and most students will say like, yeah, well, it seems like this guy, right? That's kind of white guy, anthropologist in the suit, um, you know, has this kind of very firm stance. Um, this guy's kind of like looking a little bit laid back. These are Trobriand Islanders in the South Pacific um, that Malinowski is studying, I believe. Um, and uh, this guy over here is kind of leaning against the tree. Um, and you got to imagine that there's somebody actually out like 15 feet or whatever in front of these people taking a picture, right? So what T Michael Tosik says in, in this book, it's a great book called What Color is the Sacred, um, uh, is is that this is staged, right? Like like it's actually too hot <laughs> to wear this kind of like, like white anthropologist suit. Um, uh, in the area um, and it's not this is like totally formal this is like this is not the way that people sort of interact with people on a regular basis uh, but when this image gets sent back to the United States or to Europe from uh, the the Far East or the South Pacific it gives people in those publics an idea of where power comes from right so there's this way that the colonial powers in Europe in the United States fed back to themselves this idea of knowledge that put themselves into a, peer, a position of superiority over other people, right? And that's an important thing to be thinking about when we're comparing compassion and thinking about brains and evolution and our ability to, you know, put ourselves into other people's shoes. Um, so if I take, go back to babies here, the, like what Lacan is kind of saying is that the baby understands itself as an object. And sometimes you, it m might seem weird to say this, but like it sometimes it feels good to be objectified. For example, it's kind of nice when your lover thinks that you're hot, for example, right? If you're um, in a relationship um, uh, or if you're ever, if you've ever been concerned about your body issues or like gaining weight or anything like that. Um, you're kind of objectifying your own self. And so, of course, in broader culture, we can talk about the ways that our culture sexualizes to an unfair extent women, for the obje sexual objectification of women, especially in film and cameras. When I teach film studies, that's important. But there are other ways that like, we understand ourselves as objects in the world, and, and, and that understanding of ourselves as objects, like the baby understands itself as the object of its mother's affection the baby learns that it has competition and this is there's some freud if you've ever studied freud behind here you, there's a little bit of oedipal complex here um because in the classic oedipal complex what freud says is that like the baby comes out the baby is like has this great attachment to its mother and then other it could be the father it could be other siblings for example um uh um the baby um uh doesn't want to share mom with 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 other um with other kids um and so this is something it makes sense you know i grew up in a family of, like my, i have six brothers and two sisters for example and now i have like like 18 nieces and nephews so there's been a lot of like kids around our family um and you'll notice that uh like toddlers for example they go through this stage like the terrible twos which i have a slide for coming up uh um, where where they're really wrestling with the idea that the, they you can't get everything that you want 
in the world at all times. Or if you take a, like a baby, like say you've got kind of an overprotective mom who never ever lets anybody hold her baby, like what's the first thing that happens when she has to put the baby down or hand the baby to someone else? I don't know, maybe to go to the bathroom or like, or, or to attend to something like an emergency. Well, the baby freaks out and starts crying because if you think about it from the baby's perspective, like there goes mom, that's, their, that's my food supply, that's my warmth, I can't take care of myself. And so the baby's like literally freaking out. And so um, kind of socializing babies, and I don't mean to make the, too crass of a comparison, but even if you get a puppy and a dog, um, uh, which I used to have a dog that was a really great dog, but like you have to train them to be good with other dogs, right? Otherwise they'd fight and do like nasty, like nasty things. And so you have to socialize them, right? So babies need to have that physical contact with other people, not even just their mom. They need to have physical contact and they um, uh, can't have everything just focused on one person because it's just an impossible job for another person. Um, that, that's one thing. Um, and so eventually in, in Freud's Oedipal drama, that's that's the kind of thing. It's not like that the baby, like like people will say, like like in, in the story of Oedipus, that Oedipus, you know, is fated to kill his father and marry his mother, right? And he tries to escape the fate, but he ends up, you know, like being cast away and then going back to his homeland as an adult, not knowing that... Uh, he he's trying to escape his fate, but not knowing that he's actually coming back to where he's from. He ends up killing his father. He doesn't know that he's his father when he kills him. And he ends up marrying this woman, becoming king, and then only later finds out that he's already um, killed his, his father and he's been sleeping with his mother. This is Greek tragedy. Um, uh, Lac or when Freud made up the Oedipal complex, it's not this idea that secretly somebody wants to have sex with their mom. That's not what's going on. The idea is is uh, uh, much more. It's just using the myth to to talk about um, uh, the structure of life. Like that that um, when a baby comes out, mom is the sole sort of center of affection, or a baby who is in the womb hasn't had that separation of self from self hasn't had I versus me. There's a kind of oneness there. Um, and later on with the development of identity, there's that development of desire. And the, what the baby has to learn is because the baby can't always have mom and have mom's attention all the time. And eventually, if you look at children's literature, for example, moms die. There's a lot of death in children's literature. Bambi, for example, mom dies, right? Once, once Bambi like 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 doesn't have a mom anymore bambi has to take care of himself and he kind of turns to his father it's a very edible type of story bambi but look at harry potter for example some more recent stuff harry potter kill off the parents on page one right so the character is then put into a symbolic sort of trajectory towards a future which we understand as plot in literature right uh and he's trying to fulfill his life with these other things and so we do this as humans too, right? Like like we come to use other symbols. So like the baby's like, well, I can't have mom's attention, but I'll watch Teletubbies or, you know, I'll get light up sneakers or I'll find something else to interest me because um, I can't have mom all of the time. And this becomes this kind of drama of being able to develop one's own desires and the structure of those desires and, and being able to take care of oneself and one's needs. So that's kind of like, like, like a broader way of thinking about the psychology than thinking about in some sort of crass example, like so somebody like wanting to have sex with their mom, which is gross. Um, uh, so Lacan says the mirror stage is a drama whose initial internal thrust is precipitated from insufficiency to anticipation. And what he means there is like at first, like a baby needs to be fed like baby, like human babies need milk like they cannot survive on their own. Right. They need somebody to take care of them. And so we're insufficient. If we don't like get fed, we will unfortunately die. Um, uh, but once we get our basic needs kind of covered, it goes to anticipation, right? So like, think about like a toddler or somebody's like, you know, like, like, I don't know, what are we having for dinner tonight? It's like, I, I don't know, we're having, um, I don't know, fried chicken. <laughs> and the baby's like, or the little kid is like, I want macaroni and cheese. 
I want hot dogs. I want this. It's like, it's like, well, you're going to have the chicken or you're not going to have anything like the bit. Uh, but uh, so the, there are choices, right? That's what the little kids are sort of trying to work out. And so when we take this over into literature, the separation um, that's necessary in the mirror stage introduces the ability to represent things in terms of language. So what language does is it structures this thing called, called desire out towards the future. And we see that through the development of plot in fiction, for example. Um, uh, so we represent in terms of language and we also perceive and narrate time. Right, so the, here's another way to think about this. Think about knock-knock jokes. Think about little kids and knock-knock jokes. So um, there's a structure to knock-knock jokes. I say knock-knock, somebody, the other person says, who's there? I mean, you probably don't remember if you, I mean, it'd be interesting, let me know. Do you remember the day when you learned? It's like, oh, this is the day I learned knock-knock jokes. It's like, no, that's not the way that it works. Like this is the, I remember the day that I learned the song, Mary had a little lamb. Like th that's not the kind of thing that we rem remember. We kind of um, get it by cultural osmosis, right? So maybe not every culture in the world uses knock knock jokes, but we know in, in, uh, in our culture that there's a kind of structure here. Children's literature is a really good way of understanding this. So we see the fundamental building blocks of narrative structure in children's, in, in, in jokes. Um, and that's that anticipation, like what's going to happen to my character at the end of the story. Um, so if you take like kids and you start telling them knock knock jokes, they get the structure, but they don't have the sophistication in terms of language to necessarily like come up with them on, on their own or and they don't have they haven't memorized a lot of knock knock jokes. Right. So um, you might like you know, to be telling kids a knock knock joke and then the kid comes like back to you and he's like knock knock and you're like who's there and they're like blue and you're like blue who and they're like blue flu ha 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 so they know that like you if i say knock knock you say who's there and then i say something back and then i say something back and then everybody laughs right that structure is super important that's the same thing that's happening in little kids when they're in utero right like the, learning the kind of pitch patterns of language learning the kind of ways that, that that linguistic structures kind of work even though they can't form the punchline of the joke to make the joke they understand the structure that's really important how those what i will call deeply framed structures um, develop in our brains and they can be cultural as well but i'm talking about it in terms of narrative so here i would talked about this slide a few minutes ago children learn <laughs> at a young age they have to learn this and maybe some people who've become adults didn't learn this very well but uh children uh quickly become aware of um unfulfilled anticipation um, we call this time in uh, the English language the terrible twos, which is like, you know, kids are just having a pretty tough time and they like they're having they, to realize that like the world just doesn't revolve around them. Um, and maybe some people learn this better than others at a young age, for sure. But we have a stage for it. What they're learning in terms of Lacan, like psychoanalytic kind of talk here is the difference between need and lack, right? So there, we need to be able to eat, but lack or desire structures ourselves into a future. And so for Lacan, we physically can get what we need, but psychically, we're never able to fulfill our desire. In fact, it's important to him that we never fulfill our desires. So we live perpetually an unfulfilled existence driven by a kind of capital O or something other that gives us meaning. Our meaning in our life is structured in terms of the way that we're geared towards our goals and our futurity in terms of this, that's, this is Lacanian thought. I'm just going to stick with Lacan for now. There might be some other ways to think about it, too. So here's another example. Here's a slide where I'm telling a story again. Right. OK, so meaning tends to be elusive and related to desire, yet we see meaning in our lives as not just our own personal meaning, but we see it in terms of our cultures. We see it in the ways that um, uh, 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 the meaning drives structures other people's lives around us as well. So uh, it's not just subjective, um, it's shared. So like take this example, if I go with this narrative, and again, if we were a face-to-face -face class, I would 
have you guys parse this out. So there might be some variations. But okay, so you're supposed to be going to class, but on the way to class, you like meet a hot security guard and you're flirting. Um, uh, things work out well. You get married. Um, uh, 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 21st century again. So uh, same-sex marriage is a different way that um, our conversations have changed um, in the past 20 years in the United States, for example. Um, uh, so the ways that we think about relationships, some of it stays the same, but some of it changes. You have a kid. Oops, you have another kid. <laughs> you need more money. You need a bigger house, right? And a lot of people structure their lives like this. Like, when am I going to like meet the right person, the person that I'm going to marry, the person who's right for me, um, the person I'm going to have a family with, um, and the person that I'm going to settle down and have a house with. Now, not everybody has that as as like, this is my goals and my desire in life, right? That's important. And some people will completely reject it actively and say like, I'm never getting married. I'm never doing that kind of, I'm, I'm not going to buy into that kind of existence. And that's fine that people do that. But even the people who reject it, even in the term, in the way that they reject it, they recognize and other people recognize the thing that they're rejecting. So in psychoanalysis, that's called a reaction formation. You're reacting to something else. This is like basically what happens on Facebook every day or all social media is people having reaction formations to other things, right? Um, it's like I'm getting like I'm getting really angry at something, and the the way that I get anger, no matter how angry I get at it, if I if I just keep talking my anger at it, I actually make the thing bigger, right? And so people, and like uh, politicians do this all the time, they say outlandish things um, just to get kind of media attention, to get people to react, because then people are focusing on them, no matter how like crazy the things that people say are. It's the shock value that, that allows them to keep um, discussion all on themselves. Um, my screen's just frozen here, so I'm gonna take a pause and, and I'm gonna start a new video. Um, so hang on, I'll be right back. Sometimes the camera just freezes after I've been making a long, um, uh, the audio still stays, but I don't like to see my face just kind of frozen because um, it makes me wonder whether or not the, the recording go is going well. Um, so yeah, I was talking about um, um, reaction formations and uh, um, this is a kind of psychoanalytic term um, uh, that 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 uh, we're, so, a, a structure is preserved by being the thing that people react to um, in term in, in terms of negation in terms of something that they're against right is that that being against something that creates the kind of border that makes something seem like like it's important um, uh, uh, so we can think about this also um, in terms of going back to kind of this idea of relationship structures, right? So that this slide here before, um, where if I pop back up here, this kind of overarching social narrative, right? Of finding the right person and settling down and having a house um, and having a family, right? Well, a lot of people's lives are structured by that social desire. Like we recognize it, even if we, if we don't want this for our individual selves, we recognize it as something that is structured in terms of the ways that people make meaning out of their own lives. So it's a collective, it's a socially constructed thing. Um, and so uh, um, yet, if we you know, the, go to the next slide here, a lot of people like, you know, um, have to, um, um, we have to find ways to keep striving even after sort of we've we've gotten all of those things and you know if if you're young and married I don't want to like you know uh, good good for you but for example nobody I'm in my early 40s and nobody that I know that got married like right out of high school that I went to high school with like couples um, uh, nobody who got married very quickly out of high school that I know in my friends group is still married to that same person. They might be married to somebody else now, um, but like uh, a lot of times, like people like, like like check off the boxes. Like it's like okay, you know, I graduated, I like fell in love, I had a baby, I got a house, I got all the things that I wanted. And if that worked for you, that's great, good for you. But for a lot of people, for more than half of marriages in our culture, um, that's not the way that it works. 
um, even though we have this social kind of desire, this social structure that's kind of set up to make us anticipate that. And even if we get all of those things, people might find themselves, it's like, well, I got, I've got a good house, I've got a good job, I've got like a great family, um, like I make enough money, now what? It's like this kind of boredom sets in. And that's what Lacan means by the idea that we can't ever be psychically um, uh, fulfilled, even if we can get our physical fulfillment. And that actually we shouldn't, because what psychologists are always trying to study with depression, right? Somebody who's depressed has no desire. They can't get up out of bed in the morning because there's something wrong with their kind of sense of motivation. And that's why psychologists use that term desire. It works very well for us in literary studies as well. So a lot of times people pine for marriage and then they get married and then they feel unfulfilled. Something like that um, happens as um, uh, uh, the social structure, we can see the social structure of desire at work and, and informing our lives and making meaning, even if we're making meaning by reacting against it. Um, and yet, we still have to think about how, how striving and, and um, uh, be not being psychically unfulfilled, to use Lacan's term, um, is important to us. And I would say that that's at least, if we're thinking about literature, I'm going to get to a definition later on here, um, that that might be one thing that literature does, is it helps us to um, see imaginatively what might be psychically unfulfilled or ways to arrange or, or new ideas on our heads to give us ways to think about being psychically unfulfilled when we're otherwise bored and there's nothing else to effing watch on netflix or amazon or whatever right it's like oh it's like like thousands and thousands of movies and it's the same thing over and over again literature doesn't work that way to me um, literature is much more interesting even though i teach film and i love film um, as as well so i'm not meaning to knock the whole medium um Okay, another way that this could show up is, is just another example is, is uh, religion. Um, uh, and so I've got, there's like kind of Christian looking example here. Um, loss eventually plays a part in our lives. And again, if we go back to children's literature, so much death in children's literature. It's like Bambi, Harry Potter's parents, Anne of Green Gables is an orphan. Babar the elephant his mom gets like shot a couple pages into the, <laughs> the 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 book and the reason why that happens is death is that moment where we cannot get back right just like the baby can't get back into its mom's womb and overcome that sense of separation of ourselves right that Freud is talking about in the Oedipal complex um Death is a way that like it's happened. It, unfortunately, it happens in our lives. Somebody that we know that we love dies and we don't get to get them back. And when it's a parent, it's especially hard, um, uh, especially, you know, for, for a child who's, who's learning to develop and, 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 and learning to develop ourselves outside of our parents, right? To make sure that we're self-sufficient on our own, which doesn't mean that we don't need our parents or our families at, at some point. Um, so loss eventually plays a part and a lot of times what people do is they turn to a capital O or metaphysical other when that when that um, occurs um, and there's a lot to be said about that in terms of religion and religious studies my second PhD is in religious studies um, uh, and you can ask me about that kind of individually if you have questions um, and different traditions of course deal with this um, separately but I'm, I'm really just kind of talking about like representation and how why it's important to be thinking about representation because that's what literature does right is we we're looking at representation in a very active way um, over time um, so here's another way of thinking about it, a little bit more like concrete here a little bit more concrete <laughs> this is but concrete's a metaphor right <laughs> like uh, this is not a pipe <laughs> this is a computer generated image of a pipe this is not a pipe either this is a jpeg type of file of a physical copper pipe and our word pipe spelled p-i-p-e in english is not the actual thing either right so all language is representation um here's a way that um if there are some good literature lectures online that you can watch um by Paul Fry, who's a professor at Yale. And in one of his lectures on uh, Lacan, he cites Mick Jagger. So I'm just uh, echoing Paul Fry here. Um, he says, like, unlike Mick Jagger, um, the, um, the singer of the Rolling Stones, for 
those of you who are younger, um, uh, you can never get what you want. But if you try, and you must at least try, you might get what you need. So that's a way of understanding Lacan from Paul Fry's perspective. Um, whereas the Rolling Stones song, if you've never heard it, says you can't always get what you want. You can't always get what you want. Um, but if you try sometimes, you might get what you need. But he's saying, no, for Lacan, you can never get what you want because you want that psych, like you have to have that unfulfilled psychical desire that keeps you going in life, that keeps you getting up every day in the morning. Um, that's what's important in terms of, of, of that kind of motivational desire. Um, but in terms of, of, of literature, this is like moving from one page to another and, uh, in terms of the, the unfolding of a story. So here we are, I'm getting to a definition of literature. Um, the study of literature for me, these are some points um, to start with. You can fight me on them. They are not meant to be the end all be all, but this is just a good starting place. Uh, the study of literature is about the study of meaning, but not just um, how we determine meaning, but how meaning plays a social function in our lives. So how does meaning in the terms of like that, that family structure, like, you know, having kids, meeting the right person sort of thing, those socially formed meanings, how does that play a function in our lives? Literature is about the social ways that we use language to encode and memorialize desire. It's not just some sort of private code um, or a private use of metaphor that somebody is really cryptic about um, that only make, makes sense for, for oneself. Even like a diary, if you think about keeping a diary, you become end up becoming an audience for that diary later on. So there's even a way of thinking about that being written down and, and being for others and not just for yourself. And then other people could be sneaking and reading your diary as well. But literature, if we're thinking about literature as, as, as a subject matter, literature is partially about, the, like, it's, a, it's not just about, like, the individual meaning that I might see in a text. It is partly about that, but it is also the ways that this stuff shows up socially. Um, this is why just, like, kind of self-publishing your stuff on Amazon isn't the same thing um, as, as going through a publishing company if you're, if you're trying to write, you know, because there's a whole sort of structure around um, uh, things being prepared and being audience driven. This doesn't mean that you can like write your memoirs and throw them onto the web and have people buy them and maybe get a readership. But the way that it resonates with other people is going to say something about its literary types of quality. Um, uh, just as language precedes us, no, just as no one in the room um, has a hundred or in your room, like the virtual room that we're in, <laughs> no one has 100% of knowledge of English, um, but is nevertheless proficient. Um, if you're taking this English course, I assume that you're proficient. Literature is an open system. So there's not like a time where it's like, well, we had this literature was up to this period and now literature is dead. That kind of idea. Um, uh, uh, even in, in, a, in, in an idiom like hip hop, right? Like there's a whole kind of language around whether or not hip hop is dead or alive. And sometimes I've taught hip hop and literature courses on that type of um, idea itself. But capital L literature in the way that I want to kind of think about it is it's an open system. So people can keep, keep contributing to it. We can keep looking at sort of classics, but the classics aren't just classics because they're classics. Classics are um, have this ability um, for us to kind of look back into them and, and still determine something about the social function of meaning in our lives or the social ways that we encode and mem memorialize desire. And remember, desire isn't just me and the hamburger I want to eat tonight. Desire is this kind of social thing as well. Um, so we're getting closer to the end here. Um, a couple of things. Uh, this uh, animation isn't really working right now. Let me see if it'll, oh, there, there it goes. Okay, <laughs> so uh, if you take a little kid and you play peekaboo with them, remember the kid who's like gets freaked out because mom doesn't ever like, let, like, like mom's a little bit overprotective. Um, uh, what kids do, like if you play like the game of peekaboo with kids, like what they're doing is like you pull the, the um, blanket up and you go peekaboo and you pull the blanket up and, the, and you disappear for them physically right they can't see you anymore and then you pull it down and you reassure them 
right, by saying peekaboo, and then they laugh and they giggle. And you're training a baby over time when you're playing that game to for you to exist in their head even when they can't see you, right? That's an important survival skill for kids to develop their own sense of self apart from the parent or the caretaker, right? Um, and uh, uh, there's a great book that I'm kind of pulling that example from called Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. It's a really great book for understanding the art of comics and graphic novels. He draws on a lot of good literary and artistic theory in that, that book. Um, uh, so literary and writing studies, and not just studying literature, but writing as well, consciously avows um, language play, which means that it's not fixed. Um, and, and this is why, like, in high school, you could have, like, people who get really frustrated. Like, literature, why, why do we always have to look for the deeper meaning in texts and things like, like, like that kind of stuff? It's like, well, your literature professor, language arts professor, was trying to teach you reading skills in high school. But what we do at the professional level in the adult world is we're looking at the ways that because all language is representation, there's an element of play. It's not always fixed. So there's always a kind of substitution, right? That pipe example, like the word pipe is a sound that stands in for this idea. The word tree is a different, um, uh, has different forms in different languages, or I don't know, dog, like chien in, in French, or chat, cat in French, um, uh, uh, and cat in English, C, K, A, T, like cat in, in, uh, in English. Um, so literary interpretation also um, articulates and imagines the extensions and the exteriority of closure. So closure is that peekaboo thing, right? The baby like understands that you exist when you leave the room and that you're coming back, right? That you're coming back. And they develop this abstractions like, oh, things exist, like China exists even though I don't, I haven't been to China, right? That's a way of thinking about closure. It's an abstraction in our head, but it also informs um, and encapsulates how we think about ourselves as being embodied in the world um, and the extension or the exteriority of our closure we could also think of being enclosed in our bodies right um, or we could think of extending our bodies into our bikes like or our cars like we do this with our sense of identity when i go i, I most i don't even own a car i only ride a bike but so i ride bike my bike a lot and, and to be able to survive on a bike you have to be able to kind of put yourself into the wheels and and kind of have your identity extend out into things. So you can think about clothes too. People extend their identities out into the ways that they um, put clo clothes on or fashion. Um, so we're always filling in gaps all the time and literature gives us a way of actively really working with the way substitution and absence play, right? So if something's standing in for something, what happens to that, to the actual thing in its absence, right? Um, so. Um, so this is kind of taking us in a little bit of a linguistic direction. Um, Lacan uh, says that there's, he's particularly interested in two kinds of substitution. One is metaphor, um, of which people are, are generally familiar with, I'm sure. Um, your love is a beacon of hope, not like a simile, like your love is like a beacon of hope. Um, we say your love is a beacon of hope. Or I said earlier, this is a concrete example. It's like it's not like I'm pouring concrete onto my computer screen and you know, manifesting it through the internet so that you can watch this video, right? No, that's that's the way our lang language is completely metaphorical because all language is representation, and there are more abstract metaphors than others for sure. Um, so metonymy is a particular kind of metaphor, where we take a part for a whole. That's something that's really. Um, uh, uh, something that Lacan is really interested in. Like how, if you said, have you read Shakespeare? It's like, I mean, it's not like you like went and like dug up some body and looked up the body up and down, right? Um, the word Shakespeare is standing in for a whole bunch of different plays and other t poetry, other types of, of literary works. Um, Lacan is drawing on the discourse of the, what's called structuralism. So I said that this is po a post-structuralist kind of lecture. Um, uh, uh, you can look those up on Wikipedia, those terms, and get a little bit more um, if you want. Uh, but he's building on a Swiss language linguist um, named Ferdinand de Saussure, who's a really important um, language scholar in the early 20th century, super important for Europeans and European thought. Um, uh, 
it's from Saussure that uh, we get much, but not all, of the theories of signs and meaning that um, make up what we can now call semiotics or semiology. So semiology means the study of meaning itself. Um, and so this is a common example from Ferdinand de Saussure, um, where we have S over S. The signifier is always different from the signified, right? So the signifier for dog in French is spelled C-H-I-E-N. Um, the signifier for dog in English is spelled D-O-G, right? Um, and there's a sound signifier to it too, right? Dog or chien. So the sound is not the same thing as the furry four-legged thing that's, that's walking around that we call by different names in different cultures. Um, and so uh, there's, there's a gap between the signifier and the signified, just like there's a gap between me and myself, right? Or like I and me, image of myself, like that kind of gap. Um, that uh, uh, psychologists call desire. Linguists will talk about it in a different, little bit of different way, but they're essentially talking about the same thing. And this is why theory is important because it's a discourse that allows us to see these different ways of talking about the same kinds of things. Um, and the different ways give us a different kind of lens and a different way of looking at things. So here is like William Shakespeare, maybe the person, Shakespeare, the idea, English author, collective writings of, classic author, bard, greatest like vocabulary of the English language, all sorts of things that you hear about Shakespeare. Um, studying literature means, um, again, based on the definitions I've kind of come up with here, studying literature means that we're attentive to the ways that language move, um, and meaning are created through the sparks that connect that kind of gap between desire and its fulfillment between meaning and the way that meaning is made. That's one of the big differences, I think, between a professional study of literature and plot-based reading or identity-affirming books, which are like what you do in book club, for example, like, or what was your favorite book? Or did you like that character or did you not like that character? It doesn't really matter to me in terms of like, like of this class and like the pro professional study of literature, it's not about what we like or don't like. It's not really that much about taste, right? Sometimes I have to read like historical novels that are racist from an earlier time in history or slave narratives, which talk about really awful things. And that doesn't mean that I enjoy reading slave narratives necessarily, like, like oh, this is the best slave narrative I've ever read. Um, uh, uh, but, it's important to read and understand them, right? Like to understand that like when I, if, if I'm reading in a particular period in history, I might read the famous books that are from that period, but I might read the books that didn't get famous or some books get famous later on. Like Moby Dick, when it first came out, the first 50 years or so, it had only sold about 3,000 copies when Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was published the same about the same time, sold in the millions within the first few years because people were really concerned with the issue of slavery in the 18 early 1860s late 1850s um only in the 20th century did people going back like kind of some some people kind of stumbled on moby dick and it became this like big massive classic right um so it's not about popularity or taste or liking things necessarily um, uh, at all. And it's not about identity affirmation. It's not about whether or not you like a character or dislike a character. Some writers intentionally write characters that you're supposed to dislike. <laughs> um, uh, and, and so there's what we're doing when we're studying literature professionally is, is something a little bit different than, uh, and so this is nothing wrong with book clubs, by the way, or consumer criticism. It's just a different medium, right? Like, like people like me should not get paid just for our taste. It's like, well, this is what I think is good. And this is what I'm assigning to you to read. And I know a lot because somebody gave me this like PhD in English and, uh, um, I know what's good and, and just take it from me being the, the arbiter of, of taste. No, that's not what, that's not what we do. Um, if that's what we did, I don't think that, that those of us in literary studies should have jobs. Um, I think that w what we do is something quite different. Some of it I've unpacked today in lecture and um, we'll go on with that. And you can challenge me or ask me for nuances um, as we go throughout future lectures. Um, just a couple more examples here. Um, some meanings or some symbols are very fixed. 
Um, so we know what this means and no, if we're driving in a Spanish speaking place or um, uh, um, if, if, if an English speaking space because we know of the shape and the color and all of that sort of stuff. So there's a more socially fixed meaning um, for the stop sign here. Um, but metaphors sometimes take a little bit more unpacking. So there's a metaphor underneath here. So I would say that this little icon here, buddy here, this is this is a metaphor. And if we were face to face, I'd ask people to try and unpack it. But if you look at this guy, it's like it's like, well, there's a light bulb. And like in our culture, the idea of a light bulb going off signifies having an idea, right? And then, but then we could look at this person, and, and in terms of conventional ways of dress, this person is kind of shaped and lo looks like a conventional man. So light bulb, and he's got like a briefcase, like kind of like a businessman. And so we get something like an idea man coming out of this metaphoric image. And our language is becoming more and more iconic like this. Just look at your cell phone, for example, or your computer desktop, for example. So it's important to think about language moving that way. Um, be, but even this kind of language, linear alphabetic, is also still metaphorical. So it's really important to be um, aware of these kind of nuances of metaphor and able to be able to communicate well. Um, here's Lacan again. He's really difficult to read in his own stuff. He says, who then is this other to whom I am more attached than to myself, since at the heart of my ascent to my own identity, it is he, still he who agitates me? <laughs> that's from the mirror stage um idea and so like yeah if i say i right like like i stands in for roger it's the sound science the linguistic sign for this being called roger but even roger is this name it's an old english word it's like comes from hrothgar like um as the name of the king in beowulf an old english text it's like an early form of roger um uh, and the 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 name actually means mighty sphere in anglo-saxon uh, but I don't think that my parents, when they named me Roger, life is named after an uncle, but like, I don't think that they were like, oh, we're going to call our kid Mighty Spear. Um, uh, it's the language changes over time. Uh, but if I think about like that I and, and the, the sound sign that people call me from by, neither of them actually speak to the interiority of who I am. They're just kind of external signs. And so what Lacan is talking about is like, who is this person when I talk about myself? Like, like there's like this separation of myself. There's something that's driving me to talk. There's an aspect of me that's driving me to talk. And yet, I, even as I'm talking, I'm not able to really be one with that person. <laughs> so how do I overcome that? Like, and you can think about it like time flies when you're having fun or when you get really set on a task or when you're writing and you get really in the zone and you feel like something else is speaking through you. We know those types of feelings. Um, exist as well. But when we're talking about the structure of identity, there's this kind of separation thing going on. Um, so we can think about it this way. In the statement, I am Roger, which is like English language, subject, verb, object, that's the basic way that we make sentences in English. Um, if I change it up and I put the verb first and I say, am I Roger? I literally create a question. So that's called syntax or word order in English. So when you disrupt the word order, you literally make the question. The question is about the confused nature of syntax. So it's so awesome the way that language works, that when we play with its order, we actually disrupt the meaning of order, right? Or if I say Roger am I, I start to sound like Yoda or something. <laughs> um, so at the same time, I equals Roger, but at the same time, it's not. I and Roger are different things, um, different tenses, for example. Uh, what I ought to say then, according to Lacan, he says, what I ought to say is I am not, not wherever I am the plaything of my own thought. I think of what I am where I do not think to think. So you can just ponder on that or read Lacan's mirror stage essay. I am Roger. Both the I and Roger are substitutes for an absent presence an elision of the signified. That's why it's never enough. Like, especially if you're in love with somebody, and you're like, I love you, I love you, I love you. Like, get those, like the, the words aren't enough. Like, how do you show them, right? Uh, um, uh, I is a metonym for all of my identity's potential. Roger is a metaphorical sound sign or image for both others and myself to locate me in the present, but it doesn't speak to all of who I am, right? Literature and writing versus communication then. So why, do we, why don't we just talk about communication? It's like, I think that literature is about something more than just communication. Communication is a kind of need that we have, 
right? Yes, like the baby needs to have food in order to be able to live, but then we develop anticipation and a desire, and we have desi with desire we get substitution. I don't want to have chicken tonight. I want to have macaroni and cheese, whatever it is. While communication is necessary, a need fulfilled through its process, literature and literary writing signifies a desire and an open potentiality. We don't know where it ends, but in exploring it, we track what our capabilities are. I say we because language exists prior to and among people. Like babies don't come out inventing language. The language speaks us as a famous uh, German philosopher, uh, Martin Heidegger said in the 20th century. You can think about early forms of language. Um, in Hebrew, for example, which is where we get the term Aleph, like alphabet, it comes, um, uh, when that, that gets translated into Greek characters. But if we go back to the Hebrew, the first letter in Hebrew is the Aleph, and this is what it looks like. And it stands for silent. It's a consonant. So it's not like A, E, I, O, U. A is a vowel in English, right? Um, and it's, uh, we get, you know, it starts, alphabet starts with A. Um, but it's a consonant in Hebrew and um, it's silent. Um, and we don't, ha so the, in that kind of conception, we don't have access to the origin of language. That's just a way of thinking about, about that. Um, desire in literature and writing. Um, so desire is a lack that exceeds a need. It's more than a need. Literature um, is perhaps at its most basic level accomplished by narrative. Um, what happens in a story or even in a poem? What is What happens throughout the poem? Uh, so much of literature is based on sto stories of journeys and returns. Um, but something exceeds communication of just what happens, right? If you read the Odyssey, which we're not reading in this, I, I don't think, not in the class that I'm initially making this video for. If you read the Odyssey, you know in the first stanza that Odysseus makes it home. Spoiler, right? There you go. You know he makes his way home. But like you go through, you read this really thick and long poem about his journey getting home, right? It's about the journey and the adventures in the journey, not about what happened just in terms of the overarching action. Uh, to put, there's a, a linguist named Roland Bart. Um, he come, he writes a, some important stuff on semiology, the idea, the study of meaning. Um, Elements of semiology is a really good, and it's a difficult book to read, but it's it's um, important. Uh, um, to put it in Roland Bart's terms, we may indeed get pleasure out of a plot, like Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings, whatever. Uh, but we return to some plots over and over again because they exceed pleasure and they become bliss. It's not just about like me and I really identified with this character or something. There's something more going on with that. Um, so when we look, I looked at, I used Lord of the Rings as an example there. And like, you know, these big epic movies that come out in our culture um, over Christmas and then all of the superhero movies in the summertime, our culture is very much dealing with these kind of grand heroic narratives. Um, and I might have more to say about that in, in future lectures, but I'm not going to, I'm drawn, going kind of long today. So I want to um, get to the end here. Uh, Desire and psychoanalysis this is a little bit different. Desire and psychoanalysis related to Freud's popularization of the term libido for instinctual drives. Unsurprisingly, the term um, goes through a linguistic broadening in our culture and to characterize sexual, sexual drives alone. But he was very much thinking of it in Darwinian terms, like that we have desire, the desire for sex is to procreate the species. So he's really thinking of it in biological terms. Uh, just as the sexual act alone does not extinguish desire or love, but may function as a procreative need, what Freud calls eros or love signifies an inexhaustible perpetuity. So what Roland Bart calls bliss, something beyond the initial pleasure, meaning that's kind of uh, 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 more opaque and we can't necessarily define it, we can't necessarily pinpoint it right away. That's part of what literary study is, is after. Um, uh, and, and, and also, so, so just like in psychoanalysis, it's not like we're not just talking about procreating the species, we're talking about like what, why, what role does meaning and, and the, the desire to understand how meaning is made, how does that fulfill us in a greater way in terms of our lives? Um, 
that's something more interesting in literary studies. To reduce language to a purely communicative act or function is to and to ignore the literary is to remove, I think, so this is just food for thought, um, or at least diminish the both both sorry, it should just be both the possibility for developmental growth necessarily engaged by a subject or a child perhaps interacting with a linguistic environment. Um, but it is to simultaneously remove or diminish a capacity for love. So I might sound a little bit hippy dippy there. Um, uh, excuse me if I'm going off. Uh, uh, so like, I think if we only talk about communication, yeah, we need to be able to communicate with each other. But if we take the literary, if we take the, 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 this, this blissful element out and we think that it's only about communication, then I think that we diminish that capacity for love. So this is a little bit of an evolutionary argument that I'm making for the study of literature is that actually literature does work on our compassion centers, our ability to put ourselves in other position, people's positions and to actively strategize and think about situations, even if they're fantasy situations, like a like a Frodo Hobbit, something like like dragons, um, wizards, uh, whatever it happens to be, um, it's about working not just on our creativity, but it's about the that the creativity is a necessary part of of survival. Um, so the very qualities that are biologically the most evolved aspects of our brains. I think is something that literature speaks to. And I think that literature should be having active conversations with current genetics and biology. And we're not that separate in terms of the humanities and the sciences. Literature, literary competence is not to be judged at one particular instance of a human life since to do so would necessarily set a limit to desire. Again, it's an open system. We don't want to set a limit to desire or eros or to human capability because as Lacan said, psychically we can't always get, we never can get all what we want, right? It's not about like reading everything that's ever been written. You're not going to be able to do that sort of thing. Um, it's not just about being well-read and sophisticated and like having lots of books on your shelves. It's like, you know, that might make you feel good, but that's really about other people and like that's some weird ego stuff going on there. Um, so, uh, um, insofar as we track language, writing, and literature over time, we certainly also track uh, history and culture. Um, in quotes, there's a lot to be said about that word culture. Um, and it... Uh, at times produces a binding um, in the sense of religio, right? Um, to bind or affect. So the term religion, like the term, like it could mean rereading. There are a couple different etym etymologies. Um, but if we just look at the word religio, what it means is to bind together. And um, remember my second PhD is in religious studies. So I think about this stuff a lot. Um, so if we think about a book like Entango Makes Three, um, which is a great children's um, uh uh, book if you haven't read it um, when only a certain group gets to, when only certain groups rather get to decide what texts are literarily important the desire of those individuals collects into a cultural manifestation this happened in the history of English where only white and mostly male authors were considered really really important um, and so we're always dealing with issues of more, being more inclusive uh, in terms of literary studies. It shapes the politics of our discipline and how we talk about things. And this happens to be a story um, about a couple of male penguins. It's based on a true story in the in a New York Zoo, actually, um, who uh, are given a fertilized egg and they raise a family, a same-sex family um, of, of penguins. The little one is named Tango. Um, and super interesting and also was at one time um, at least a controversial um, book in terms of the ways that people talk, think about gender politics, about sexual orientation and inclusivity in our culture. Um, uh, uh, I, 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 sometimes I read it to my students in, in this lecture, but I'm not going to read it. You can read it on your own. Um, those who are not represented, who are left out of the ways that we talk about literature and think about literature, are literally denied access to full citizenship in, at, in a community, right? So if only like people of one ethnicity or one gender or sexual orientation, for example, 
um, determines what is good or classic or high capital L literature, then we run into a whole lot of problems of equity or inequity, really. And so we need to be thinking about that pretty actively. Um, and we'll be looking at a lot of different literatures in the course, but of course we can't read everything, right? So this is an introductory course that um, this I've set up this lecture for. Um, uh, and we won't be able to read everything, but we, what we want to focus on and not being able to read everything is some of those theoretical elements. And th again, that definition of literature, which like, like my definition of literature is not about high art versus low art, for example. Um, it is about the way that we track desire, socially constructed desire, right? So for me, we live currently in a time of vast expansion of what literature and literary writing means. We teach classes, I teach classes on film, um, where we basically treat film as literature. Um, to those who consider themselves outside of a system, if kids grow up and they don't see characters or um, read texts that they can sort of identify with, they're going to see themselves as outside of that society. And this happens especially with race in the United States, um, but as well as with gender as well. Um, uh, um, so uh, they come, kids grow up with an idea that the only like good people like look this certain sort of way and then they're not they look like don't look that way or um and and they feel less likely to participate in the culture if you ever look at the history of the case of brown versus board of education that's part of what the race conversation looks like in terms of pr proving it in a court of law um children young african-american children were looking at dolls um and they were picking white dolls that, they, that the white dolls were better um, because they they had already sort of embedded a kind of uh, class or hierarchical status that people with white skin and blonde hair or blue eyes are naturally better and so because of that they wanted the white dolls um, which and they were never going to be white human beings and so that uh, it was going to cause them stress, psychic stress as they grow up. So that's that's kind of how the argument goes. You can read up on Brown versus Board of Education for a more detailed example of that. Um, so representation does really matter to us, and um, uh, more than just um, calling it something like just reducing it to something like identity politics. Um, but we want to think about uh, um, meaning and how it's structurally desired, right? So when we talk about being inclusive, we talk about gender, we talk about race or something in, in contemporary literature, we're talking about a socialized desire, right? Like how do we make our society better for, um, it's not just about being more inclusive to be more inclusive, it's about like, like, like it's about compassion, right? It's about like uh, um, um, being able to get along with, the, with with people that are different from us. And literature is a really powerful way of um, being able to expose ourselves to different kinds of experiences that we might not normally um, get access to. And we might not be able to live that the same existence of, as other people, but we might be able to get, if we're working on our compassion centers, we might be able to get a, a little bit um, more of a sense of humility <laughs> for the kinds of experiences that we don't have. Um, whether it's an actual person, actual sort of like gendered situation or raced situation, or like wizards and dragons, right? Um, bunnies in, in uh, um, Watership Down, for example. Uh, to those highly invested in the potential for literature to express desire and potentiality, generic or surface engagements with literature as only pleasure and not bliss seem backwards and ignorant. And so I think that that's important, right? It's not important to be like, oh, well, some texts are bad or like, um, like, you know, I don't know. People say this about things like, like some, some students were arguing in one of my classes one time that Hunger Games was bad literature because it was really popular. I actually think the Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins is a great literary text about a young woman who doesn't know who she is. And she's been kind of so traumatized that she doesn't even have a sense Katniss Everdeen. If you read the book, like read the book, not the movie, but like, like, the, read the book and the language is so stripped down and and she doesn't know who she is and the language reflects that 
And that's something beautiful that the literature does. But some some of my students, I think wrongly, a few years ago when they were having this argument, thought that just because it was this very bare and stripped down language, and because the book was popular, automatically wasn't really good literature. Um, so I would challenge those kinds of, of, of ways of thinking of if you're gonna impose a kind of hierarchy on literature. Rather, I would like us to think about literature and how it expresses social desire. So if we see a lot of concern with race or gender or ethnicity in current literary discussions, it's because that's what we're dealing with in our culture right now. Um, and they're important conversations to have. Um, so to those highly invested in the potential for literature to express desire and potentially generic or surface engagements with literature as only pleasure bliss, they seem backward and ignorant and that's not to say that like if somebody writes a review on amazon.com uh um that uh that they they uh uh are somehow like like inferior if somebody just goes to book club um excuse me i'm texting i have somebody coming over and they want to bring their dog um uh yes i'm saying uh uh, social engagement in my backyard. I don't get to do it very much. <laughs> social distance party. Um, so um, here are my politics um, uh, as I go in future lectures that I try to be transparent. It's part of my teaching philosophy. Um, uh, and so I'm just trying to be on the level with you as much as I can. Um, to be involved in teaching literature and writing is to be involved in the political process of what social desire is and how it's coded. And by politics there, I don't mean Democrat and Republican, I mean power relationships, right? Um, I'm, it's being actively engaged in how social, social desire um, is constructed, how it's coded, of who's included and who is excluded from participating in the languages that no one person owns, but which come to shape and to speak us. All teaching, also just ending here, all teaching is a kind of indoctrination. Um, doctrine, doctrines have underlying theories. So um, learn to distinguish what's at stake in yours and choose wisely and feel free to ask me questions about why I've come up with the theories that I've had. What are the politics behind my theories? There are politics behind the ways that I think. I think about them a lot. <laughs> I engage with it all the time. And I'm not just, again, I'm not talking about, you know, P political parties like Democrats or Republicans or something like that. I'm talking about power relationships, but of course the philosophies um, sort of uh, have their way of unfolding and the, they, they show values underneath. And those are active conversations. Feel free to disagree with me. Um, feel free to come up with your own definitions of literature, but this at least gives us a start. Thanks for your patience. This is kind of a long lecture today, um, but uh, uh, check your reading lists and your syllabus. Um, that correspond to this lecture, and um, we'll keep up the conversation in future um, uh, lectures. Um, definitely reach out to me via email for questions. Take care and have a good day.